Hello. <laughs> Do you have questions about how to be open to more children? When are you really ready to have another baby? And is the role of the government to support baby making? <laughs> These are some of the things we are going to tackle today on the Possibility Mom Live. So should the government be involved in supporting people having babies? This is something that is a very interesting question to me, and I'm just going to be super straight up with you. I would not call myself a sociologist of any kind. Like I, I, I'm very um, interested in sociology. I'm very interested in how we all interact with each other. But I wouldn't say that government policy or um, investigating or asking these kinds of questions is something that I, to be honest, spend that much time thinking about. But as a person who lived in Canada, for my whole basically life, where we had things like socialized healthcare and where baby bonuses in the province that I lived in, so both the federal and provincial government gave my family um, a little bit of money based on my income and in proportion to how many children I had. So that was an example, obviously, that I grew up with um, understanding the government supported me in that way. Um, moving now here to the U.S., where it's a very different healthcare system, and you know that's a conversation for another day. That's not something I'm going to launch into right here. But I've had to think. It, it's it's forced me to think about the role of government, and is that should the government be supporting people having babies? So I, again, not something I've thought all that much about. I would not call myself an expert by any means in this arena but when this this um article was sent to me and it is uh, an article describing hungary's position on supporting babies i was really really intrigued and so if you'll allow me just a moment i'm going to share my screen with you and share this article with you because I do believe that it bears paying attention to. So this is the um, Kate Cat Cat. Forgive me, Catalin Novak, the 43-year-old Minister for Families and Vice President for the governing Fidesz Party in Hungary, says the government first began to experiment with nas national family policy when they determined early in their mandate that popular support for such policies existed. So in other words, the people of Hungary were saying, we want more support from the government. One of the key problems Novak told me in an interview was the state of marriage. In most developed countries, the popularity of marriage is evaporating. In Hungary, the number of marriages dropped 23% between 2002 and 2010. In response, she says, the government decided to support and incentivize marriage because marriage is a more secure place for childbearing. The experiment worked and the trend was reversed. Since 2012, the number of marriages in Hungary has doubled. I'm really curious what they did to incentivize marriage. In our basic family law in 2011, there are fundamental pro-life and pro-family principles, Novak explained. That means that, for example, we put in our constitution 10 years ago that life begins at conception and the life of the fetus should be protected. So where I want to get to here is what they give families. So our tax system is very family friendly, Novak explained. The more children you have, the less personal income tax you pay. How interesting. From January 1, 2020, mothers with at least four children have a full exemption from personal income tax. Everybody, did everybody just hear that? In Hungary, a mom like me, who's got eight kids, I would pay zero personal income tax. I would never pay <laughs> personal income tax ever in my life if I currently lived in Hungary. I find that really interesting. Um, again, how they afford this, very interesting questions. I'm not here to debate that. But here's another one. If a woman has a student loan, 
once that woman is going to have children, we decrease the student loan. Like, so interesting. For the first child, we postpone the payment for three years. For the second child, we decrease the loan by 50%. For the third child, we totally write off the loan. That means she doesn't have to pay back her student loan. <laughs> like, you know, and there's more. A home building subsidy, three-year paid maternity leave, expanded childcare, free or discounted summer camps for children. Newly married couples can get an interest-free loan. So listen to this. The government will give you in Hungary an interest-free loan of $30,000, equivalent U.S., which comes with a three-year extension after the first child, a 30% reduction after the second. And if you have a third, the government says, don't pay it back. Mortgage assistance that allows young couples to have a head start without needing massive savings or family help. So, <laughs> again, I'm not here to debate is this possible? Is this realistic? I'm really curious. Let me know in the comments. What do you think about that? So I feel like there's a couple questions I want to explore with you all today. Number one, should it be the government's job to aid in helping families? Now, of course, I am biased in my outlook. I don't think I could ever see my life in any other way. But I think what the question we want to circle around that is does supporting families help society? And that I think is a key question to think about. Does supporting families help society as a whole? So one of the things in the in the work that I do coaching moms is, uh, you know, I, I coach moms on a variety of different topics, on business, on personal, um, personal development, on their habits, and money is something that comes up. I, I coach a lot of moms on how to build wealth for their families by starting businesses because inevitably what I'm hearing, and if you remember my conversation a few weeks ago with Amanda Texera, we talked a lot about wealth, building wealth, not feeling guilty about wealth, how to manage a family's budget, all those things. It's simply a reality. Money and children do go hand in hand. Does it have to be expensive to raise kids? I argue it doesn't have to. However, it is a reality. Feeding them, clothing them, keeping them warm, all the things, there is a financial um, expenditure related to having children. It is only, only natural. And so if the government were to support the financial effort that, uh, that uh, or the financial expenditure that children incur, I... I I think that would be a great thing to society because what I think it would produce is less stressed out moms, less stressed out dads, because maybe the moms wouldn't be complaining to the dads that they're so worried about money. I'm curious what it would do for family life. Would it allow one of the parents to stay home? Would it allow for more creative pursuits around maybe entrepreneurism or what have you. I'm really curious and I'm asking the question. So you guys like, let me know. Let me know in the comments. Is money an impediment to having more children? Is that something that has crossed your mind? And if so, would you welcome the government giving you money like they have done in Hungary? You know, and I'd be curious if there is somebody out there who has a differing viewpoint, like if, if somebody out there has studied this you know, in depth, because again, I, this is not an area I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, it, it's definitely very interesting when it applies to families. I'm really curious. What are the pros? What are the cons? Obviously this costs money. Where is that money coming from? Um, but is this something you would get on board with if it were you? Do you think that Hungary has got it right? Or do you think there are way more costs involved? But again, circling back to that question about financial pressures on families. Again, I'm not naive. This is a reality. But it's interesting to think about what if that was completely removed? What if or 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 lessened? What if the the pressure because the government was helping you out in a really substantial way was pressured? What would that do to society? How could that help families thrive? How would that 
contribute to healthy marriages, all the things. I don't know. Let me know <laughs> what do you guys think. I'm really excited to bring on a very special guest, the beautiful Adele Collins. But before I do that, because I feel like she's going to have some really <laughs> strong opinions on this topic. I'm really, really curious to um, get her opinion. But before I do that, I want to share with you something that is coming up this weekend that I personally am so excited to participate in um, and that I think you are going to benefit a lot from too. And that is from my dear friend and client, Jill Simons of Pink Salt Riot, the Mission of Joy Summit. This is a Catholic three-day virtual event with more than 30 amazing speakers, including yours truly. I'm going to be speaking live on Sunday night. And it is... A, this is Jill, if you remember her. She was one of my guests on the Possibility Mom Live. This is a event, if you struggle with finding joy because of suffering, if you struggle with finding joy because of distractions, if you struggle with finding joy because you think that joy is simply unattainable, I want to invite you to click the link below this video and check out the over 30 speakers who are coming together to talk about how joy is a choice and how it is 100% possible to find joy in whatever is going on in your life. Alrighty, so check, take, take, click the link below. Like, click it right now, because tickets are totally free, and the speaker lineup is honestly amazing. All right, well, everybody, for those of you on Instagram, you might know her as Simple Life Musings. I know her as Adele Collins. And the way that I came upon Adele, was through this fun little hashtag, postcards to Macron. And it's such an interesting, like the, the, it's very, very interesting to me that I chose to talk about Hungary and that Adele is coming on today. This was actually not really um, planned. <laughs> it, 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 we, had we had planned to talk about this Hungary thing um, for quite a few weeks, um, but it's super fun that Adele is coming on today. So I discovered her through this hashtag. And if anybody remembers what was going on back then, this is about maybe two to three years ago. And the president of France, um, President Macron, I'll pull up my Canadian Francais, Macron, had said, show me an educated woman who has chosen to have a bunch of kids. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but that was essentially the heart of his sentiment. And so then this hashtag emerged, postcards to Macron, where these families, large families, with educated mothers <laughs> were showing pictures of their kids, showing pictures of their degrees, showing pictures of how they were educated. And this is how I discovered the beautiful Adele. I love following her work. I think you will love following her too. Give her a follow over at Simple Life Musings. Welcome to the Possibility Mom Adele Wallace, how are you? Great. It is so good to see you. Oh my gosh. Okay, stop for a moment. Where are you? You're in your sunroom. I'm on the porch. It's raining outside, so hopefully the audio is okay. But this was, I figured if I just kind of closed myself in here, it might be the quietest spot in my house today. Oh, so. <laughs> so, for anyone who might not know who you are and what you do, share with us a little bit about you. Um, so my husband, Ben, and I, we have seven kids. We are currently in the D.C. area, um, raising a big Catholic family. Um, I have a background in academia. I have my master's from Harvard and I knew, always knew God laid it on my heart that I wanted to have a big family. And by the time I graduated from grad school, I was seven months pregnant. So we have had seven kids since then. We've moved, we were living in California for four years. Now we're back on the East Coast. Um, but yes, it has been such a gift to find this community of like-minded, beautiful, educated, supportive, joyful Catholic women. It has meant so much to me, especially in those years that we were far away from home and kind of struggling to find a community in person. Um, so I have, Lisa, you're like a celebrity in my house because my kids love your book. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I just, I love the work you're doing. It's so uh, important. Well, so the love is totally mutual. Now, one of the things that I really do love about you is just how gosh darn stylish you make everything. So I have a, I have a, my undergrad was in fashion and then I went on to do interior design. And I just, I think that was the thing 
once I started following you because of the hashtag, those cards to my phone, that was the thing that really struck me. I'd be like, what is she wearing today? <laughs> you have this fun, very feminine, very easy. Like everything you wear just seems like very easy and not, you know, you know like I, 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 there's an ease to the way that you approach your life and the way that you design your home. It was all kinds of fun to follow your move from California to DC. So my, my first question for you is why the move from California oh, yeah. to DC? So there's a couple different reasons. We're from the East Coast originally. So this is home. Um, so we were away from home for four years for my husband's job. He works in tech. So it sort of took us out there. And it was a great adventure. We loved living out there and making new friends and exploring that area. But we always knew we wanted to come back here. And to be honest, part of it was there is such a vibrant, active, fun Catholic community here. So that has been worth the move a million times over because there is just, um, I mean, you know, because your kids are probably about the same ages as my kids, but it's so important for them to have friends with who are also Catholics, who come from Catholic families. It's important for us. And um, so that just brings together this whole community dynamic. Um, our diocese is amazing here. We're in the Arlington Diocese, which we love. Um, so that faith part of it, the schools our kids go to, just all of that has been um, incredible. And I think a big goal of ours as parents is to give them that support that they can, you know, a big part of a kid's formation is the community that they're surrounded with. And I think as they enter high school, it becomes even more important. So um, that's been really beautiful. We just love this area. We have an incredible, really vibrant, huge community of Catholic families, probably similar to what you guys have, I'm guessing. Yes. Um, so that's been beautiful. And, and we're kind of East Coasters at heart. Mm -hmm. I think that just growing up here, we like the like museums, the culture, just, I love talking to people. Like my ears perked up when you were talking right before I came on the show about, you know, how should the government help families? Should they help families? I love thinking about stuff like that. And so the East Coast is like, that's what people love to talk about here. So um, it just feels like we're right at home. We're right where we belong here. So let's launch right into that because I'm really genuinely curious. So you, you shared when you introduced yourself that you have always been open to having a large family. So it sounds like your Catholic upbringing or Catholic influence probably had something to do with that. You obviously came to that conclusion also probably on your own through various discernments. Just full transparency, I was not like that. I was raised mm -hmm. Catholic, but I was very, very fearful about what having a large family would do to everything to my marriage, to my ability to feel free, to my ability to work. For me, it was like a real journey to get to the point of um, where I feel now, which is just very free and very not afraid. But yeah. it was, it seems like for you, it was on your heart. You, it, it, I, I love the visual of being seven months pregnant because that's like big pregnant. That's like throw, showing through your gown, like, like your graduation gown pregnant. Um, I love that visual of you that pregnant, graduating from Harvard, everybody. Harvard, mm -hmm. just like <laughs> Harvard. She went to Harvard, like Elwood's Harvard. <laughs> anyway, so I love that visual. Um, so it seems like it has always been something you've been open to. So share with us, is that accurate? And how do you believe that you got to that place? So that is true. I did when Ben and I got married, we're high school sweethearts and we got married really young. It was the day before my 21st birthday. Um, and I told him I wanted nine kids. And at that time he said three was what he wanted. So we're the, I feel like the scale is tipping in my direction. Like we're closer to nine than three now. Um, but I did always want a big family. I think part of it is my, my own family story and my own upbringing. I'm the daughter of two really amazing Polish immigrants. So they came here just a couple years before I was born. And in this country, like on this continent, our family was constituted of probably like six people total um, in our whole extended family. Um, so it was me and my sister in our little nuclear family. And my mom had a cousin that brought us to this area and she had her and her husband have two kids. So it was just a very small family. So I think I just was very, I have always found big families to be really beautiful. I just love the life, how um, verdant and lively. And it just, 
every interesting book that's written about a family seems to be based on a big family. And I think that's just because it has this interesting drama. You know, there's all these human relationships and so there's, and it unfolds over time. There's just something so beautiful about it. So I have always admired from afar big families and knew very little big families growing up in this area. Most of my friends probably were one of two kids. And when I met my husband, who was the youngest of four, I, I just didn't even understand that having four kids was like possible. It just seemed so like such a big family. So I just loved, I was very drawn to the idea of having a, a big, lively family with lots of personalities, something always going on. I always dreamed of being in the middle of that. Um, so it is something I've always wanted. I don't know that I knew exactly how I was going to get from point A to point B. And it has not been smooth and easy. So even though it's something that I wanted, after I had my first baby, who was beautiful, sweet, fussy baby, I had a fussy first baby, I had serious doubts. I remember telling Ben, you know, I think one might be enough, actually, at the end of the day, after nine. And because it was just so much harder than I imagined. I had this really romanticized vision of it where it was going to be just you know, the beautiful parts of motherhood and not the difficult parts of motherhood. I had never done anything that hard before. Mm -hmm. um, so at that point, it really became Ben encouraging every single baby that we had, you know, saying, um, just pointing out what joy it brought us. Um, so I think for me, motherhood was probably the single way in my life that God has actively drawn me closer to himself. Mm -hmm. the most consistently and profoundly. Um, I think that God knew that I needed that tough first baby to really humble me and also just bring me closer to him, um, kind of open me up to um, to the challenges that lie ahead without that um, kind of romantic vision of what it would be, but really seeing the beauty and the difficulty, being able to embrace both of those things together. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was in uh, at Harvard, I talked to several older women who I admired, who had families, um, who were professors, which is what I thought I wanted to be at the time. Um, and they really encouraged me to have kids young, which is interesting that all of them said uh, their biggest regret was that they had waited until after they had gotten tenure, after they had gotten their PhD, all of that stuff to have kids and found it was a lot harder than they thought that it was gonna be, that it didn't come easily to them. Um, so that was really formative for me to, to say, you know, I could take this one path and continue on the road that I'm on. And then many years later, probably at some point in my thirties, um, start having a family, or I can, we can embrace the kids that God gives us in the middle of it and see where that takes us, what that path is like. So that's the path we ended up taking, um, and I've loved it. It has been joyful and wonderful. I think the thing that I like about um, looking back on those early days in particular is just sort of the easygoing nature of a young couple, you know, that we, um, like, we didn't have anything. You know, we lived in a little apartment. This is a cute story. We used to take out $50 in cash in single dollar bills. And that was our grocery budget for the week. So we'd like walk down and buy what we needed in groceries and then keep the rest in a little jar in our kitchen. And that was like our coffee money that we could use for coffee. So just like really, so that's kind of, I think simple life musings was yeah. really born of that time of just saying that um, even in very simple day to day, circumstances. We didn't have much stuff. We didn't have much money. Ben was working his first job. I was, you know, just out of grad school, that there is so much beauty and purpose. Um, and I think it's all about trying to find that baseline wherever you are, even if you're living in the midst of wealth, even if, if you're, you know, have a thriving career of sort of finding what that baseline is that gives you joy and purpose, um, especially as a mom. So what is that baseline for you? So for me, I love to have a lot of time with my kids. I think that's something that I found. Um, for us, early on, we made the decision that we wanted me to stay home so that we were going to sort of prioritize this. And to be honest, in those early years, it was difficult because just the, the finances, lining everything up when you're in your 20s, you have a couple kids. Um, it was really tricky. Um, so I remember at that time looking at our friends who were both working 
Mm. You know that, what is it? They call it the dinks, the dual income, no kids. Yeah. Friends in our 20s, and they were living large compared to us. They were really living large. Um, so, but we knew that I think there's something beautiful about having a parent, whether it's the mom, whether it's the dad, somebody who's available to the kids, or at least having the flexibility that you can build that in. So for me, that's what brings me joy. That's what makes me more relaxed, more present is when I have sort of quantity instead of quality time, you know, that I feel like having a home base here with my family, um, that I fit the other, whatever endeavors there are going on, whether it's a ministry at my church, whether it's a ministry on Instagram, whether it's, you know, a conversation with somebody fitting that into my family life feels much more joyful and relaxed than trying to fit my family life into my professional endeavors. Mm. So for me, that's what I found to be true. I have girlfriends who are working in incredible careers, doing different things, and they found a different baseline. So I think it's more, it's really about seeing what God has specifically called you to in your day-to-day -day life. So fascinating. Okay. So you said something earlier that really struck me that I want to reflect back to you. You said, it certainly always hasn't been easy, but I, I just, you make it look easy. So peel back the curtain for anyone who's thinking that it's easy for you every single day. <laughs> Give us an example of a, something you would love to up level your skills in currently in raising seven kids. So I will tell you, looking, I think every journey of motherhood is going to have a sink or swim moment. It's going to have a time that just sort of breaks you. Um, and it could be with a single kid that's whose personality, whose learning style, whatever it is, is really stretching you as a mother. For me, that moment that really broke me was um, we have a lovely set of twins who are now seven years old. But between the time that they were one and two years old, we had five kids that were all very young, including a set of very mobile twins that were moving in opposite directions. Um, and that was, and the reason it broke me was because up until that point in my motherhood, I had always been able to hold it all together. So I was the person who would bake the casserole, you know, have a really tidy house people could come over and count on me and so it was really i had always relied upon myself and myself alone and all of a sudden i could not rely upon myself i could not do everything that needed to be done it was the most difficult humbling moment of my life it broke me it totally broke me and it also opened me up to the love of God in a way that is more profound than any experience in my life. It has totally altered the course of our family life. It's changed the way that we live. I no longer expect my house to be perfect. I no longer hold myself to those standards. So, you know, like yesterday was, um, our kids finished school this week, they're out of school. So, you know, you wanna be like the fun mom and have something fun for them. So old Adele probably would have had a list of things that I held myself to that was throwing a party for my kids with handmade treats and crafts and forget about it. I am not gonna do all that stuff. And I've learned my kids don't even really care about those things. Those were things that I cared about. Those were things that were signaling to my friends about my status or my ability. So I went to, the, to Harris Teeter, our grocery store and got like a pre-made carrot cake you know, and brought it home. And my kids are like, woohoo, this is great. You know, they are thankful, forgiving. They love me because I'm their mom. They don't love me because I'm perfect in every little thing that I do. So I feel like I've been able to live with a lot more joy and authenticity within my family just to say, I'm not perfect. I can't do everything. I don't expect myself to do everything. And so now when there is a crunch time where there's something really tricky that happens, I will ask for help. You know, I will ask my husband for help. I'll ask my kids for help. I will ask friends. I, my mom is over here right now, hanging out with some of my kids while I'm chatting with you. So just kind of giving myself that freedom to say, we women have always needed support in raising families. And what we have tried to do in sort of creating this idol of the perfect mother is not authentic to our history as women, first of all. We've always needed help and support. We've always had neighbors, friends, family members, multi-generational families. You know, all of this stuff has been going on. 
So it's not true to the way that women have lived throughout history. And it's not fair to ourselves because we're setting ourselves up for failure. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're not going to be able to be everything to everyone. We're going to have to make choices and our, we only have so many hours in the day. We have to prioritize what's important to us. So it might not be making the homemade cake, even though I love homemade cake, you know, um, on any given day. So, so I think that that's really like you would be, if you came over here and hung out with me for a day, you would see that all of life is kind of beautiful, joyful, lively, and totally imperfect. It is just like any family. There are arguments that are going to happen. There are times that I'm going to say, I'm going to spend like 20 minutes in the bathroom because that is the quietest place in my house just to catch a breath, you know? Um, so all of those things, I think, being um, gentle with ourselves, also being like seeing ourselves the way that God sees us instead of the way that a critical analyst of our lives would see us really changes the um, the way that we can forgive ourselves, the grace that we can offer to ourselves and to, to the people around us. Yeah, I love that. The, the, the grace we can offer to others when we are graceful to ourselves. So mm -hmm. let's talk about support. What do you think about Hungary? And do you think that would ever fly in the United States of America? <laughs> I, am, I will say a disclaimer. I am not a politician. I've lived my whole life in the DC area. So I've been surrounded by people who are in the world of politics, but I am happy to offer an opinion on this matter any old time. So um, I am Polish. My parents are both Polish. And in Poland, we have a really similar program. Um, they called it 500 plus. And so for every child, it used to be from starting from your second child. Now it's from your first child. You get 500 zwote, which is the currency a month. So we, like you and I, Lisa, we would have, just for being mothers with our kids, we would have the salary of a teacher, like an average salary of a teacher for having the quantity of kids that we have. So um, I, here's the thing we have to understand is that already right now, our government is prioritizing certain things and subsidizing certain types of life choices. So we can choose what the government wants to subsidize as far as what is incentivized, what is punished. Right now, there actually is a penalty for people who are married as far as receiving any sort of help or support from the government. So we're incentivizing for people not to be married. So instead of a penalty, why don't we give a bonus to people? Because we know that the foundational building block of society is going to be strong, intact families. That's the single thing. All the studies show it. Having an intact family is the single best way to ensure that a child grows up to be in the middle class, basically. Um, so let's do that. I actually do like the idea of supporting, um, you know, we already, the government has said, we're gonna have government schools. We are gonna subsidize, they subsidize, every taxpayer pays their money towards government schools, which function as a daycare. So they are from, I mean, they're teaching kids. I've had my kids in public schools in the past. They're in parochial schools now, but um, they are scheduled so that they function as daycare from nine to, you know, like whatever, three in the afternoon to work around parents' schedules. So that's what we've decided that we're prioritizing. It's really valuable to have a parent at home with kids, whether it's the mom or the dad, it is a valuable thing that has been studied and shown to be a benefit, not only to the children in that family, but to the community at large because of the social capital that's created when a parent is at home, where we're helping with the parish, we're helping with the, dr the food drive, you know, all of these things are um, like our schedules are able to accommodate those things better. So yeah, instead of doing a forced universal preschool, why don't we say we're going to give every parent of a preschool aged kid this quantity. You can use it for preschool. You can use it to have a parent at home. I like that idea. Um, I like I think it's been interesting. I'm sure you've been following it, too. But in the last month or two, there's been a lot of research that's come out about the demographic winter that we are entering as a country. So it's been interesting because you and I, like we, we bonded during a time that probably what we were saying, which was that there is beauty and joy and goodness in a big family, that was very countercultural to say that. What was that like four years ago, three years ago? Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting because I think that everyone has recognized that our falling birth rates in this country are a national tragedy, that they are not leading anywhere good. It's not gonna be sustainable for our society, for our culture, for our 
basically seniors are not going to be able to be supported because there's not a workforce to enter into the workforce because just aren't children being born. So it's been interesting to all of a sudden have this switch where it's like a hot topic, you know, that people are saying, we need to have more, more kids. We need to have bigger families. And like Lisa and I are like, we got gotcha. you. <laughs> so we, we were there before it was cool. Um, but you know, yes, it costs money to raise kids. So if this is something that's valuable to us as a society, how can we support people in doing that? I'm a huge believer in the Catholic schools, and I've seen the way that they have transformed neighborhoods, both in suburbs where I live and in urban environments where there are really struggling schools and Catholic schools can go in there and just turn it around. So I love the idea of giving parents the option of having a sum of money that they could use either for the government school or for sending their kids to the Catholic school. Um, I think that giving parents that agency and choice really empowers them. So I love that. I love that idea. That's another way that we can sort of open up um, the conversation about how we're using our government funds to help families. Um, so I like it. It's been interesting to see. It's very bipartisan. You know, there's people on both sides who are coming out. Mitt Romney came out with a proposal for a child tax credit. Um, so I love that idea. I think let's do it. Let's see. Let's support people. Um, and acknowledge that what we're doing is a good, not just for our families, but for our society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the thing that's interesting that you pointed out very clearly, it's just a different distribution of money. We already spend money to support families, but why not give it back to the family to decide how they want to spend it themselves? So that's very interesting. So let me pivot this conversation into a little bit of a different way. And, and guys, if you have questions for Adele, Keep them coming in the comments. We will ask her. When do you think you're ready for another baby? So this is a question that I get asked all the time. How do I know if I'm ready? So what would you say if a mom was coming up coffee with you on your porch saying, how do I know Adele if I'm ready to have another baby? What would you say? I would say that as a woman, we have to really be, and as a mother, there are so many different factors and layers of our life as uh, the mother in our family, um, the wife to our husbands, we're responsible for our kids. So early, I feel like in my early days, it was really just about physically when I felt ready to have another baby. You know, I was in my 20s, pregnancy was pretty easy, childbirth was pretty easy. So it was like a pretty quick turnaround time of feeling like, you know, maybe when my baby was weaned was when I would feel ready. But as my family has grown, I've become sensitive to the dynamics of between kids and my families. Like I said, after we had twins, it was a really tricky time that sort of everybody in our family was stretched. And it was really, uh, um, it was just, we had to rebuild the whole family, figure out how are we gonna do this? What is it the day to day gonna look like? Josephine, our sixth child was born when they were two. And all of a sudden we sort of had to do that all over again. And it was a really challenging time. That was probably the first time in our marriage that we just felt we just need to pause and catch our breath here. We just feel like there's so many things going on. It was very tricky in the day to day. It was taking a lot of um, focus, organizing, receiving help, all of that. Um, so mental health is a perfectly, it's a very important part of that factor, not just our mental health, our husband's mental health, our kids' mental health. How is it thriving? How is it functioning? That being said, in my own life, I have experienced and I have seen in friends' lives, can God stretch us more? Does sometimes the arrival of a new child at an unexpected time, are we opened up and is our love expanded in a way that is beautiful? Yes all the time, absolutely all the time. Um, but just thinking about that moment that all of a sudden I'm like, I am ready. I really want to dive into, you know, the project of having a, like another baby together, which for us is often we're really open to expanding our family, to having more babies. Um, so I would say that physical health, um, mental health, emotional health. And then I know for some families, we talked about finances, but I feel like that is a factor in the conversation too of saying, for us, our big investment this past baby was we needed a bigger car. So we got the Nissan 12 passenger car. And I remember it, that was a big, you know, we had to save up for it. We had to sell our old car, get this new car. Um, so 
For me, um, I think there are two separate questions. One is when do I have a sense of total kind of peace and readiness? Um, and then the second question is um, like, when does the baby actually come? Because those two things don't always line up perfectly in my own life. So um, I think also just having the flexibility to say, you know, our love is fruitful, sometimes in ways that is really prolific, sometimes in ways that we weren't expecting twins. And we got them and they are amazing. We love them. God gave us exactly what we needed. Same thing I've seen with friends who, who receive a special needs baby. That might not be what you felt fully ready for, but it's what God called you to. And there, it's just beautiful the way that those circumstances in, in my life, those circumstances have actually been the most profound experiences of God's love that I've ever experienced. And it often has come in a moment that I feel unprepared. You know, it's, it's, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much for that. And, and the thing that I, that really resonates with me is that, well, God can stretch you to be ready, quote unquote. Cause yeah. you know, I don't think anybody's ever ready. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, and, and, and here's the reason why I actually think maybe the am I ready question isn't actually a helpful question. Yeah. Because there's just too many factors. So there's two, number one, there's too many factors. And then number two, can God stretch you to quote unquote, be ready? Absolutely he can, right? So I, so what is the better question, Adele? I, I don't know, I haven't thought about it. Rather than am I ready, what is a better question we can ask? Maybe what do you need to thrive? You know, what do we need to thrive as mothers? Because I think that's really what we're trying to get at with that question of, are you ready? The question is, do you feel like you are thriving? Um, and so I think that instead of we, we sort of basically um, try to get everything perfect before the baby comes. But I think instead of that approach, there's something to be said for like, what do we need? What do we, and then that begins a process of conversations, prayer, assembling what you have, you know, like it just sort of, um, maybe it's a mom swap, like switching babies with a girlfriend one morning a week. So you can go to the grocery store or maybe it's sending your kids to the local Catholic school after you've been homeschooling them and you just need a year off. Um, so I think just looking at your life and saying, what what's holding me back from thriving? And that's really what you what you do. That's your work, Lisa. Yeah. Like you help women. So I think that that's really the question that we need to be asking. Yeah, and what it is at the heart of it all is skills. You know, when, when I, I, I counsel a lot of women, myself included, Adele, everybody, just everybody, myself included, lots of conversations on overwhelm. Literally before yeah. live today, my husband and I had a very candid, very candid conversation about some areas of our life that we are feeling overwhelmed in. Yeah. And so I think what you're saying here about what do I need to thrive, what you're identifying is maybe what skills do I need to learn? So whether it's the skill of delegation, whether it's the skill of how do I clean efficiently, whether it's the skill of how do I cook efficiently so it doesn't take me four hours to cook a meal yeah. or what have you, or even a simple adjustment like buying the carrot cake. You know, I'll never forget it, it made it into a story in my book. I was uh, coaching a mom and she was telling me how she was so overwhelmed and late for our coaching call because she was at Whole Foods buying the organic vegetables and then chopping them for a vegetable platter that she promised to bring to the kids' school. And that's why she was late for the call. And I just remember I leaned into the computer and I was like, next time, buy the pre-made organic <laughs> I, you know it's just and again that's just like a, and it made it into the book and i remember i gave her the book not realizing oh my gosh she's gonna recognize i remember i physically delivered it to her door realizing that actual story was her and that she was gonna read it and totally know it was her anyway we had a, we had a laugh about it when i pointed that out but you know i i, I think it's something as simple as that like I don't need, maybe in a past time, making the vegetable platter was therapeutic, exciting, fun, but it's not something potentially I should prioritize in this season. 
yeah. I can totally spend an extra three dollars or whatever it is to buy the pre-made vegetable, and the, the thing has, has has successfully made its way to the school. So I think that's what you're talking about. Is it's like what skills potentially do I need to grow in so that my family, so that my marriage, so that my home can thrive? Yeah, that's yes. absolutely like really get cool. the Instacart. There have been whole seasons of my life, like years of my life, that I have gotten the Instacart and. That saved me a huge inconvenience. It would have stressed me out. I would have had to take a bunch of little kids to the store and then been angry with them for not behaving appropriately. You know, like it just wasn't developmentally appropriate for them to be lugged around on that particular errand. And um, so I think that that's really great about the world that we live in now. I think there's a lot of really clever ways that people have found to um, figure out some of these tri tricky things um, to be able to cut the time. Um, my mom was a working mom growing up, so I saw her doing these things. And like, there are so many ways we can cut the corners. Um, and I think the thing that's cool is like the kids, do your kids care if you chop the vegetables? No! Kids at the soccer, no, no one cares. No one cares, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I think it, it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't talk about trusting God in the midst of all of this. So. I'm a Catholic, you're a Catholic, our Catholic values absolutely influence how we live our lives. And so this is something we have to talk about. Where does trusting God, you already said it, that God can trust us, even when we feel like we're not ready? I guess I'd love to know, give me like one concrete story of how you potentially didn't feel trust maybe around family size or maybe around, I don't know, anything related to having a large family. Um, but then God really did stretch you and you were able to trust him. Mm. There's so many stories to draw from. I think for us, um, one time that always feels really vulnerable is when you are preparing for a really big change. Mm -hmm. So for us, that happened when my husband was switching jobs and we were planning both. There were two big moves that we did in the last six years, one to California and one back here. So I, in our family, I'm more of the planner. So I'm the one, I'm not always an awesome planner, but I'm the one who has more of those skills. So I tend to be the person who sort of plans things out, makes the list, checks off the boxes. So I think that there's a, a real tendency to try to feel like we have to make all of these choices perfectly. We have to do everything right and then good things will happen. And in doing that, we're not trusting in God. We don't believe that God is always working for our good, that God has a plan for us, that he loves us like a father, that he really wants us to be able to trust him. So I remember when we were getting ready for, we, we knew God had laid it on our hearts that we wanted to move back to be closer to family. Um, so we were living in California um, and there were just so many individual things we had to figure out like where would ben work to make this happen where would we live where would the kids go to school all of this stuff and it was just very overwhelming and i went into planning mode where i was like this 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 this, this is what we can do this is what we can work through and it sort of worked myself into this tizzy of trying to plan it all out we had little kids our um josephine was i guess three had just turned three um five-year-old twins, you know, all of our kids in different stages trying to figure out what their life would look like. And what was incredible was I had signed up to go on a silent retreat in the middle of all this. So there were like a, a million things that I had put into motion very much not trusting God, but trying to sort of force this move on my terms of what would be convenient or good. There was an offer we had in on a house. It was like progressing rapidly. Um, and I went on this silent retreat not having a sense of peace. I did not have a sense of inner peace at all. It felt like I was trying to force all of these things in a way that was um, just not good for our family. It wasn't good for, it wasn't um, giving me a sense of peace. It wasn't trusting God. Um, and just prayed silently for those. This was a retreat I did not take any kids on. It was just me, beautiful silent retreat for four days. Um, and during that time of prayer, being close to the Blessed Sacrament, receiving communion, I mean, just having that introspection, being able to really listen to God in those days, um, I came back to our home and said, we need to put everything on. The, we just need to forget about all of this stuff. We need to call the realtors. We are not 
retract our offer. We're not putting an offer in on that house. We are not going to force this. We have to have a sense of peace and really listen to where God is calling us. Um, so that night when I got home, I had a package in the mail that had come to me while I was gone. And it was from Mary Lenneberg. It was her first book, which was Be Brave in the Scared. Um, and I read her book that night and just felt such an affirmation. She talks a lot about trust in that book, about trusting God through circumstances that are sometimes very difficult, but just sort of what that journey of trust looks like. Um, it was such an affirmation to me of this um, pulling back from trying to really force our way through this major life decision into a position of being much more um, receptive to where God was calling us and prayerfully discerning it instead of just trying to make it happen. Um, and so it was really beautiful to see the way that our life, our new life here that we now have in Virginia unfolded over a series of things that felt very providential um, from my husband's job to the house that we ended up in to just all of these little details that felt so overwhelming to me that I was having so much trouble trusting God about. They came together so much more beautifully than anything that I could have ever planned or decided or forced. And then the, I feel like the icing on the cake is soon after we moved here to Virginia, I got pregnant with Mary, our baby. And just like that beautiful gift of a new child. Um, so I don't know, God is so good. God loves us. He wants what's best for us. Um, and it really, that's a big a big topic. A move is something that probably pe most people will only experience a couple times in their life, something that large. But for me on the day to day, it still happens all the time. And that's always my default is I think I can do this. I can, I can get everything together. I can, you know, get this just right. And I can't because I'm not perfect. I can't do everything. So just say like, God wants us to ask him for help to just stop throughout our day and to say like, literally it was two days ago. Um, I was just totally overwhelmed. It was a tricky week. We have a lot going on, end of the school year, all that stuff. And I just went to our church and just prayed before the blessed sacrament for literally like five minutes on my way to the grocery store and just asked God for help. And I had just forgotten that I could do that again. It's like every time I forget, you can just stop and ask for help. You can just stop. Like that's what he's here, here to help us, you know? Um, so I think that that's probably just the challenge for all of us, whether we're moms or not, but just to say, ask God for help. He's there to help us. He wants to help us. Um, so we just have to remember. Adele, I could literally talk to you all day. I look forward to the day that I can join you in the beautiful Hallmark movie home. It is a bit of a <laughs> home. Um, we got some fun comments from Amy. Adele is so gorgeous. What a beautiful oh, thank you. I look forward to the day that I can come and spend some time with you on that porch. And I hope we should really plan. This. We should really do something. Yes. Your home. I'll come to you. I will come to Florida. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we'll travel to Florida. Yes. I love it so, so much. All okay. right, well, thank you so, so much. So uh, it's a joy. Always a joy to chat with you. Next time, let's do it in person. You're so fun. Well, my friends, here's the thing that I want to just really highlight from that beautiful conversation. I think where children are concerned this might be slightly this might trigger some people so everybody just gird your loins for a minute <laughs> this might trigger this might be triggering but i think even if you don't struggle with it at the heart there's a thing with control and children that i think is a natural um fear or a natural thing that happens it's like if i have another baby Will my life be out of control? I struggle with control tremendously. That it is control. I am a choleric. I'm a sanguine choleric, so I like the fun, but I am choleric through and through. I love to control things. You know, that story of Adele's move reminds me a lot of my own move from Toronto here to Southwest Florida. It is the thing. I, I see a spiritual director every three weeks. It is what I talk about without fail every single time. But here's, here's the thing that I think is so interesting. If we want to combat control, 
if we want to be open to God's will in our lives, if we want to let him in and, and, and just see what he can make possible, we have to relent of that control. In my own life, just to speak very personally, um, he's really done that in me through being open to babies. There have been times that I haven't wanted to be um, pregnant than we were pregnant, or not even that, that I, let me retract that. I, I think I've always been excited to be pregnant, but I, have, I, I had a fear. That's a more accurate statement. I was fearful about how could we manage, you know, the house is already so messy. The, um, my schedule is already so burdened. I remember particularly going from one to two, being very afraid. I was still in my, um, <clears throat> I was still in my interior design days back then. I was working in television. I had been told explicitly that getting pregnant would be a detriment to my TV career. And so I, I had a lot of fear. I remember going from one to two and then at various other stages of my, of my, my family life, um, I've been afraid. There, there have been times that I've been afraid, but that fear dissipated, I would say, um, after baby number five and then really dissipated after baby number six. And then I would say baby seven and eight, <laughs> just really like, <laughs> it was just sort of, and I think what has gotten me to where I am now and guys like family size is obviously personal choice. I do not believe for a single second that everyone is called to have a big family. If this is triggering for you, like, please hear my heart. It is such a personal decision. Um, the Catholic church leaves it up to families to discern this. Um, you know, it's, it's in our catechism. Um, but I believe I've gotten to this place of not having fear because of the habit of trust. I have developed the habit of trusting God through being able to recall how he has shown up in my life, being able to recall and reflect upon when he has been there, even when I felt like he wasn't. And that is, I think, the you know, whatever you want to call it, the antidote or the, you know, the, the, the kryptonite, so to speak, or whatever the better analogy is to control is to developing this habit of trust that Lord, you have the best plans for my life that you desire for me to have a future full of hope. And therefore I'm going to trust you, you know, and, and there, that's that line in Jeremiah, forgive me, what is it? 29. Josh, put it in the chat. What is it? It's 2911, right? 2910. Oh my gosh. Um, but it's the line after that. So he says, I, I know the plans for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for woe. Plans for a future full of hope. But it's what happens after that. What happens after that? He says, if you call to me, I will answer. And that's what Adele was was witnessing there in her story of on her way to the grocery store, on the way in the midst of being overwhelmed, you know, between all the responsibilities, all the duties, all the things, taking that moment and calling to him, he will answer. So if this is something that you struggle with, if control, if feeling fearful, if feeling like you have to have every duck in a row, that you have to be ready, whether it be a baby, whether it be um, a job, whether it be um moving, whether it be just listening to that call of God in your life to take a plunge, start a business, you know, whatever it is, call to him and he will answer. That has been the, the clanging gong, so to speak, of my life is this habit of trust. And it is a habit like anything that I believe we can all build. What do y'all think? Let me know. <laughs> Has this episode challenged you, frustrated you, left you with more questions? Leave me a comment. Send me a DM on Instagram at Lisa Canning. If you would leave a review of the podcast wherever you love to listen to podcasts, it would really help me out. 
And I'm just so grateful to spend some time having these honest conversations with y'all. I hope that this provided you some hope, some insight, some inspiration as you enter into your weekend. And we will see y'all next week. Thanks for tuning in.